content of this interview is provided for information and education purposes only. You should consult your physician for advice on treatment, including supplements. Supplements may interact with other medicines and other health conditions. So please check with your doctor first. Welcome back to our series of 10-minute interviews on the B1 therapy with Daphne Bryan. Welcome back, Daphne, and thank you for joining us today. Today, we'll be answering questions on B1 therapy posted by Facebook members of the Parkinson's B1 therapy group. Gimus asks, is the B1 protocol to be continued indefinitely? Can we stop B1 therapy at some point? From our current experience, the B1 protocol needs to be continued indefinitely to maintain improvements. There is evidence, however, that after being on the therapy for some time, you can take quite a long break from B1 before you lose the symptom improvements you've gained. I took a two month break at one time and was only really aware of a return of fatigue. Dr. Costantini suggested that a break beyond three months would cause Parkinson's symptoms to start to worsen once more. Thank you. Now we have Lorenzo and Iris who ask, if B1 greatly improves the symptoms, can one stop or reduce levodopa? There is a study by Luong and Noyen where five men with Parkinson's were given very large doses of B1, actually seven times that used by Dr. Costantini. The three participants who were still in the study by day 10 were able to stop their levodopa medication completely. But before we all get excited at the prospect of swapping our levodopa meds for B1, we don't know what happened to these men beyond day 10 or whether they were able to continue without levodopa. Dr. Costantini made sure that his patients were on enough levodopa to make up for the dopamine shortage caused by neurons no longer functioning. It was never his intention to reduce the person's medication. High dose thiamine therapy is an adjunct therapy, not a replacement for levodopa. Louise asks, does high dose thiamine affect dopamine production? Studies have shown a link between thiamine and dopamine and have shown that when you increase one, the other also increases. If taking thiamine increases dopamine in the body, this might explain why some people on starting B1 find that they develop dyskinesia, which goes away when they reduce their levodopa medication. I must stress, however, that any reduction in prescription drugs should be done in partnership with your neurologist. Now we have Jay who writes, it is noted that improvements are made up to six months into therapy, then no further improvements. Is this true? Some others have made further improvements over a year. Is there any research or evidence to support this? There is no research evidence about how or when improvements appear. But from what people report, most symptom improvements do seem to occur in the first six months after finding the right dose. You do need to keep monitoring symptoms, however. Some of us have found that we have needed to reduce our dosage over time to maintain the good results. And now we have Becky, Tony, Tobia, who ask very similar questions. Is there any evidence that B1 therapy can help in Hashimoto's thyroiditis, fibromyalgia, and other neurological conditions besides Parkinson's? Most of the experience of high-dose thiamine therapy is with Parkinson's. 
However, Dr. Costantini also published case reports on the successful use of high doses of B1 with a number of other conditions, including spinocerebellar ataxia, Frederick's ataxia, fatigue in MS, fatigue in inflammatory bowel disease, and fatigue after stroke, fibromyalgia, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, dystonia, chronic cluster headache, and essential tremor. I suggest that if anyone is interested in any of these conditions, they read the research, which is referenced in my book. Now we have Tobia who writes, my husband was diagnosed with type one diabetes and two years later with Parkinson's. My questions are, in your experience, have you noticed the link between the two diseases? Is it safe for him to take that thiamine? Is thiamine efficacious also in diabetes mellitus? Let me comment on the links between diabetes and Parkinson's first. Diabetes increases the risk of her Parkinson's, especially in people over 65 years and with possibly a longer duration of diabetes, more than 10 years. An increasing number of studies have found a link between insulin resistance and not only type 2 diabetes, but also neurodegeneration, like Parkinson. Diabetes and insulin resistance influence Parkinson's prognosis with worsening of motor scores, cognitive deterioration, and faster progression of Parkinsonian symptoms. Second, reduced glucose tolerance is common in people with Parkinson's and levodopa and dopamine make it worse. Levodopa can cause hyperglycemia, high blood sugar. Fourth, there may be a link between fluctuations of glucose levels and dyskinesia caused by levodopa. Next, glycemic control in people with Parkinson's is important to reduce the effect of glucotoxicity. Last, Many studies have reported thiamine deficiency in type 2 diabetes. Thiamine has been reported to reduce glucose levels in hyperglycemic patients, but this effect was not confirmed in a recent systematic review. Now, Daphne, would you like to add anything? I'll just add that Dr. Costantini found it necessary to monitor patients with diabetes treated with insulin as when they took B1, these patients often showed a slight increase in glycemia levels. We always recommend though that people with Parkinson who also have another health condition should consult their doctor for advice. That's, that's a good advice. Edna asks, does high dose thiamine taken long-term affect the liver function of the kidney? The literature does not report any problems with high doses of B1, even when taken over a long period of time. Neither have we had any reports of any problems in our Facebook group. And there are people in our group who have been taking B1 for five, six years or more. And now Valerie's question. If I'm changing from oral to sublingual B1, should I have a break or could I go straight to the sublingual dose? Assuming you hadn't overdosed on your oral dose, there is no need to take a break when changing from oral B1 to sublingual B1. The purpose of taking a break is merely to allow thiamine levels to lower if they were too high. Right. Now we have another question of sublingual B1 asked by Kimberly and Johnny. If sublingual and oral are not equivalent in dosage, what is 100 milligram of the sublingual equivalent to in the oral pills? Unfortunately, it's impossible to work out an equivalent formula between sublingual and oral tablets because they depend on different factors. The efficiency of oral administration depends to a large extent on the efficiency of a person's gastrointestinal system, while the efficiency of sublingual administration depends on how one the, well the B1 passes through the mucous membrane in the mouth and on into the bloodstream. So dosage depends on factors which vary from person to person, 
and vary between methods of administration. And here we have another question about sublingual B1 from Valerie. She asks, why the 10 minute wait between having a drink and taking sublingual B1? In your book, you describe how to take B1 sublingual in detail. Could you please explain it? The 10 minute wait after drinking the water is simply to allow the body to become hydrated. If you take the sublingual tablet first thing, then the body has probably been without hydration for many hours. It will absorb the thiamine better if you allow the water you have drunk to hydrate the body properly. So the instructions for taking sublingual tablets. Firstly, drink a glass of water before cleaning your teeth or eating or drinking anything. Wait 10 minutes. Then place the tablet under the tongue where it will dissolve very quickly. Try not to swallow or the thiamine will be lost in the digestive system. Do not lie down or it will be very difficult not to swallow. Do not eat, drink or clean your teeth for 30 to 45 minutes. Food or liquid can wash away some of the dose. Don't smoke or chew tobacco for two hours before or two hours after taking the tablet because it can prevent the mucous membrane from absorbing the B1. And that's it. Thank you very much, Daphne, for answering our questions. Thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, please post them in the Facebook group on Parkinson's B1 therapy, and we will answer with Daphne in the next interview. Bye-bye, all.